Welcome to this podcast from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Reading, Massachusetts. I'm Rev. Tim Cutsmark, the minister of this regional church serving communities north of Boston. We are an intentionally inclusive congregation, welcoming people of all ages, beliefs, religious backgrounds, cultural origins, differing abilities, and sexual orientations. If you are in the area, know that you are invited to join us for Sunday services. For more information on our church or on Unitarian Universalism, please visit our website at www.uureading.org. That's www.uureading.org. And now, Please enjoy this podcast of the sermon. At the dinner table, we were polar opposites, my sister and myself. As a kid, she would eat her food so slowly, I sometimes feared she would starve to death between swallows. I, on the other hand, was famous for snarfing down my food like a Hoover vacuum cleaner. I barely chewed a bite. And I find it fascinating that many years later, when I teamed up with my partner, Jim, the difference in table tendencies again reared its head. I could finish a meal off in three minutes and have the dishes washed in four. Jim, on the other hand, would be still savoring his first bite. Actually, watching Jim eat is a wonder in itself. His eyes close, these waves of pleasure dance across his face, and he is transported into a world of tingling taste buds. For me, eating has always been utilitarian, done with a minimal modicum of awareness. For Jim, eating is a slow and sensual experience. Experience, something steeped in time. How much time do we take to eat our food? How much do we taste our food? Can we remember the flavors and textures of what we ate for breakfast this morning? Can we conjure them up? How aware are we of what we are putting into our mouths. In our fast-paced world, the time allotted to eating has, for so many of us, grown shorter and shorter. Leisurely meals filled with unhurried conversations are getting more and more rare in our overscheduled lives. We eat at our desks. We eat standing up. We eat on the fly. Our families eat whenever there's a quick moment between soccer practice and dance class to try to grab a bite. I know of this speed eating firsthand. At one point about 10 years ago, I mastered the art of driving to work in rush hour while eating a bowl of steaming hot oatmeal. Whether we cook it ourselves, microwave it or pick it up at the drive through window, most of what we are eating today could be called fast food for the speed in which it's consumed. I wonder, what are we missing by not taking more time to eat? John Kabat-Zinn, in his wonderful book, Coming to Our Senses, writes, one way we know the world and are in touch with it is through the mouth and the tongue, through its fine-tuned ability to distinguish textures, temperatures, and taste. The tongue is relatively large in the sensory map of the body in the cerebral cortex, reflecting its importance as a vehicle for knowing the world. As babies, we all put things in our mouths. That was a primary and very direct way to explore what things were. Rocks are hard. Sand is gritty. Blueberries are squishy. Everything has its own unique texture and feel in the mouth. Nevertheless, for the most part, as adults, we eat with great automaticity and little insight. The Buddhists 
have a great word for the opposite of automatic. Mindful. Mindfulness. Rana Kabatsnik writes in The Zen of Eating, mindfulness is the natural capacity for observation and reflection. It means paying attention to whatever is present moment by moment. Listen to John Zabit, John Kabat-Zinn describe a moment of mindfulness he had with his molars and his mouth. He writes, last night at a local restaurant, I ordered the cilantro green curry halibut with jasmine rice. It was an amazing combination of textures and tastes, each mouthful a supernova of subtleties. Every mouthful of fish cooked so as to melt in your mouth invited a silent pause of, no exaggeration, dumbfounded ecstasy. There was also a sensuous lingering after each mouthful with the swirling, explosive blending of refined taste that was the source of such pleasure, mildly sweet, a touch of coconut milk, and intensely peppered, but somehow not too much. Ultimately, he writes, it is impossible for me to describe it. Hearing about it will never give us the flavor. For that, we have to take it into our mouths ourselves and taste it in order to know it. Here, the tasting is the knowing. Here, the tasting is the knowing. I'd like to do something a bit different for a sermon. I'd like us to share a moment of mindfulness and eating. You up for it? Okay. We're going to pass out bowls of berries, and I'm going to ask you to take just one, and put it in the palm of your hand, and please, please, please don't eat it just yet. So Maria and I will pass, and Alex, I don't know, can you give us a little berry passing music maybe? And if you just, if you want to take him, then just pass it, pass it down. Thanks. I'm going to take one. So to begin, just hold out your palm and notice the shape of the berry. Just look at it. Notice the different bumps and ridges and wrinkles. Maybe yours is a little smushy like mine, so there's a lot of moisture on it, a bruised place. Maybe hold it up to the light. Just watch the light dance over the surface of a berry, a light show in itself. Now maybe just take it between your thumb and your finger and lift it off your palm and just bring it gently to below your nose and just take a sniff. See what it smells like, what subtle or not so subtle smell. <laughs> Now, without putting it in your mouth yet, just bring it slowly and touch it to your lips and just feel that moment when berry and lips meet and feel the touch of your flesh to the flesh of the berry. Sense it. Really allow yourself to be healed. 
And now in a moment, I'm gonna invite you to open your mouth, not yet, and to just put it on your tongue, but be very careful not to bite it yet. And then maybe just close your mouth around the berry, but don't bite or swallow. So just right into the mouth. And just shut your mouth and just feel it on the tongue. Let that tongue sensing feel. Perhaps your mouth is already starting to salivate a bit. Maybe you just move it gently a bit in your mouth, but don't break it yet. And in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to take it and take one bite, and only one bite, just bite down one and notice the flavor. So all together, gently, let's take one bite and just sense, taste the richness and the fullness. And you, we can continue eating that berry mindfully, each bite, each swallow. I see lots of smiling faces. Yeah. Isn't it remarkable how multi-layered the taste of one simple berry can be? Just one. One berry can remind us about the wonders of the world. And as we take time to eat mindfully, as we become more mindful of our mouth, our awareness might expand beyond taste and texture to consider other aspects of our food. Maybe where did it come from? Where was it grown or raised? And in what conditions? How did it get to our plate? Are the ingredients natural or chemical? Whose hand picked or slaughtered it? Were they fairly paid for their labor? Can they afford to feed their family? What is the larger impact of our food choice on the fragile ecosystem of our planet? Eating mindfully expands us beyond ourselves and reminds us of the vast interconnected web of all life of which we are a part. This mindful way of eating has even spawned a worldwide movement called the slow food movement. Anybody have hear of the slow food movement? Okay, so a few of us. It was begun in Italy in, eight, in 1986 by Carol Petrini. The slow food movement offers an alternative to fast food and speed eating. It links the sheer pleasure of food with a real commitment to community, to eating in community, and to the environment. The slow food movement promotes ways to live as a sustainable community, preserving traditional and regional cuisine, and encouraging the use of locally grown produce and livestock. This slow food movement has expanded to include over 100,000 members with chapters in over 132 different countries. So this mindfulness, this growing awareness and time taking with our food, it can grow in our own lives naturally, in our day-to-day -day life, gently. Victoria Safford, who's a mom with young kids, writes how she and her family began to practice mindfulness at their mealtime. She says, at our house, the table looks like a hungry, tattered family at the end of a tattered day, sometimes at the end of its rope. We scramble to set the table, to dislodge the cats, and scrape our chairs into place. We clatter in, then get up again to wash somebody's hands, then finally sit down. We light the candle, reach for each other's hands, close our eyes, and sit in silence as long as the youngest among us can stand it, which is generally up to as high as she can count. We are in a self-imposed timeout. In that timeout, the smell of the food becomes real. We are together in this one holy moment. We're home. We have food. We recall that many don't. We are infused, and time is infused, and something wells up, something like gratitude wells up, overflowing. She continues, we are trying, all of us, 
in all our houses to be aware. We are trying to slow down. We are trying to remember our true and real life. We're trying to touch that, to call it up, trying to know we are alive, hoping to mold that knowing into good work, hopeful, brave, and helpful later on. We're trying to remember what we love and what we do and how to be ourselves. Good gift. See, we can remember so much when we take the time to be with one another and to be with our food. That's why I'm so happy that we as a church community are embracing the topic of food for our all-church community engagement project. Last year, we, the members and friends of the church, voted to spend the next two years learning about food, from how it is prepared to how it is shared, from how it is grown to how it is slaughtered, from hunger to ethical eating to access to healthy food for all, what's called food justice. But we're going to do more than just learn. As a church community, our hands are going to get involved. This community engagement project will be a chance for all of us, young and old, to get out beyond the comfort of our campus and do some good, take some action together. That's why I'm so glad that our Helping Hands Outreach Program is partnering us with the Food Project for next year. As we heard earlier, the Food Project has built a national model of engaging teenagers in personal and social change through growing food on local farms. Over the next year, the teen leaders of the Food Project will come to the first Sunday of each month here at church to work with our coming-of-age classes one and two. We're also going to offer educational forums to the wider community, focus on educational eating and sustainable consumption. We'll go out and work for a day, perhaps, at one of the farms. We may be building a raised bed on our campus for growing food to share with those in need. We can volunteer at a food bank or serve meals at a nearby homeless shelter. And because we're out in the community, people will learn about Unitarian Universalism and the things we stand for. We get to spread the word about the Food Project and Unitarian Universalism. And for the folks less mobile, we'll have phone and letter writing campaigns to our elected officials to raise their awareness on issues of food justice and responsible consumption. We'll have information that you can pass to your kids and grandkids to encourage them to take time to help heal our world. And there's one thing everyone will be easily able to do. We're going to eat. We're going to take time to eat, to eat together a lot of good food. Our eating is going to begin this upcoming Saturday, November 5th at 6 p.m., at our harvest dinner potluck. Everybody is invited to join us, no matter if this is your first time at church or you've been here 84 years. For our harvest potluck on Saturday night, all we're asking is you just cook something you love. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be meat, vegetable, it, whatever. It's something that you love, something that makes your taste buds come alive. And so we're gonna be able to taste that as well. We're also going to have fun, and we have some food-related activities for kids and adults this Saturday, 6 p.m. I have one more thing to invite you to consider. Perhaps you would like to become part of the Helping Hands steering team. We're looking for a few more folks to help coordinate our projects. We promise your time obligations will be minimal, but the impact on the community could be great. Laura Hackle, our Helping Hands team coordinator, will be in Fellowship Hall after the service to answer your questions. And Laura, can you just sort of dance down the aisle a little bit so everybody can see you? That's Laura. Very good. She has Helping Hands, and she hopes your Helping Hands will join her. So as this reflection on food comes to an end, I hope that we will all take time to be mindful. I know as one of the most unmindful eaters among us, I'm going to do my best. May we take the time to be mindful of our food, where it comes from, and how what we eat impacts the world. But most simply and most importantly, may we take the time to 
become aware of the food that is placed in front of us. May we take the time to slow down and truly taste what we are eating, to sense the texture and the temperature, to savor the flavor of it all. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen.